Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about what is Chainlink, a fundamental analysis video. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the Telegram channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Chainlink is a project I've been following for a number of years, and I actually have it in my portfolio. And I wanted to do a fundamental analysis video on Chainlink in the same way that we did one on Ethereum. I would actually recommend watching the one on Ethereum as well if you have not seen that one. I will leave a link to that one in the description below and it goes through important concepts that you will also see in this video. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and jump in. So what is Chainlink? Is it something you wear around your neck? Or a Chainlink fence? No. Chainlink is a framework for building decentralized Oracle networks to facilitate off-chain data and compute needs of hybrid smart contracts, enabling the reference and execution of on-chain data if they are called upon to do so. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Thank you for, thank you for enjoying the fundamental analysis video. We'll see you guys next time for some price discussion. Clearly I'm kidding. Um, but I, I, let me repeat this again because we got a lot to unpack here. All right, we're gonna do we're gonna use this video to unpack all this. Okay, so Chainlink is a framework for building decentralized Oracle networks to facilitate the off-chain data and compute needs of hybrid smart contracts, enabling the reference and execution of on-chain data if they are called upon to do so. Okay, so maybe just pause the video, look at that sentence for a little bit, try to understand what we're talking about. Obviously, we're going to unpack this as we go. And with that in mind, you know, this video is not going to, we're not going to really be talking about the price of Chainlink so much, but I would like to address, I know a lot of people at the current phase of the market cycle are somewhat disheartened that Link has not performed better, okay? And, and it's been my contention all along that to a large degree, Link operates very differently than a lot of other cryptocurrencies with regards to its price. Again, it does improve your covariance matrix when you're talking about portfolio theory, okay? It doesn't move as much in tandem as, as other cryptocurrencies might with Bitcoin, all right? And remember, even during the bear market, Chainlink was, was doing relatively well, okay? And again, I know some people are upset by the price, and maybe they should be because it's only up a very modest 28,462% since inception. So perhaps we should have a moment of silence for their hardships. So going back to this, we said it's a framework for build, be it building decentralized Oracle networks. When we, we mentioned two specific things, off-chain data and on-chain data. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this as well. All right. So the first thing we can do is we can we can sort of look at what Chainlink is trying to accomplish. OK, so this diagram uh, and I have the source down here in the bottom left. It, this is architecturally how Web3 is going to look as the world transitions to hybrid smart contracts, which will need data from billions of edge devices and sources. And we've talked about sharding before. We talked about when we talked about what is Ethereum, right? We talked about what is Ethereum. You know, what is sharding? Why do you want to use sharding? How does that fit in with everything? Um, what, is, what is Web3 going to look like architecturally? And I think this is, is a good way to, to conceptualize it, all right? So essentially, with, with sharding anyways, you're gonna, have, you're gonna do your raw data analysis off-chain, okay? Because you don't wanna like clog up the network doing it on-chain. This is one of the ways that Ethereum is hoping to scale as well, right? Using sharding to help declog the network. But raw data analysis off-chain, then the output of that analysis back to the blockchain, right? So that's the idea. You, you, you perform the computation somewhere else that don't need to be performed on the blockchain, and then you give that output back to the blockchain, right? So this is this is what you know, this goes back to the what is Ethereum video, but at least this diagram should helpfully conceptualize what Web3 is going to look like as the world transitions um, uh, to, 
uh, to hybrid smart contracts, right? And and I mean, this is, is it looks very similar, right, to the whole um, the cloud fog edge problem, right? We, we've, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure many of you guys know about that already, but this is this is sort of a conceptualized version of of what Chainlink is trying to accomplish. You can see Chainlink is down here, master both worlds. Up here, you have trust trust efficiency with the main chain and then the sharding. All right, let's continue on. What is on chain data? What is off chain data? All right, well, on chain means it's on the blockchain, right? It's on the job. It's actually on the blockchain. Um, blockchains are highly trusted. Why? Because you have the ability to verify across the entire network. Okay. Why else? They're cryptographically secure. They're external disconnection from other processes. Okay. So they're, they're self-contained. But it does come at a cost, you know, with everything in life, I mean, with engineering and whatnot, there's always a trade off, right? If you if you're doing something one way, it probably means that there's a trade off to not doing it another. We've talked about this with decentralization and centralization before. I'm a big fan of, of decentralization, right? But decentralization does have its own costs associated with it, right? There, you can easily think of, of scenarios where, where having it um, might not be the best thing. And that's why, you know, that's why our world has, has more or less just been a whole centralized show for, for quite a long period of time is because people want to have the power to, to do stuff. And there are, of course, you know, you, you, know, you can, of course, imagine scenarios where um, decentralized uh, routes are, are not necessarily the most ideal in the short term. And this goes back to, again, the what is Ethereum video. And, and with Ethereum wanting to, to scale, but also not sacrifice decentralization. Well, again, what is, the, what is the limitation of that? Well, you see other chains pop up that are essentially clones of, of, of Go Ethereum, and they just raise the block limit, right? They, they, they raise it and then parade themselves around like they're the best thing since sliced bread, when literally they're just a clone of Ethereum. And, and they basically are sacrificing um, decentralization and you might say well how does that sacrifice decentralization well again it's just because if if you're if you're allowing if you're allowing the block size to go up then it's going to make it computationally more expensive for nodes to operate and with more expensive requirements it, it makes it makes it so less people can run nodes and therefore it becomes more centralized so there are trade-offs for, for decentralization but again it's because of that some people prefer centralized projects. Okay. And we saw this during the last, during, during the first leg of, of this market cycle, there are plenty of projects that were a lot more centralized than Ethereum. Like wait, I mean, first of all, I would say Bitcoin and Ethereum um, are two massively decentralized protocols. But when we talk about Ethereum, okay, it is massively decentralized compared to all these other, all these other um, uh, projects. Okay. And, and it's trying to solve things in a way that other projects are not willing to solve them. Note that Chainlink is, is, is an ERC-20 on the Ethereum blockchain, if you're not familiar with that. So that's what I mean when it comes at a cost to limited functionality, okay? Doesn't mean that we're not working towards improving it, but that's where we currently are. Intermediate transactions are not desired as they require network validation, just like final transactions. And then the blockchains are decentralized computer networks that seek to keep final transactions. So we wanna talk about off-chain data now, all right? Off-chain data is real-world information that is not on the blockchain. Okay, it's just it's not on the blockchain at all. All right, and and there's sort of got it. There has to be like a bridge between between the on-chain and the off-chain. Off-chain data can provide something that blockchains cannot: information outside of the blockchain. If you're on the blockchain, how do you access information elsewhere? Okay, a reduced cost in smart contract execution. This makes sense, and you guys understand this. We see what happens when, when networks get clogged, right? The price of the gas fees go up like crazy, and then everyone starts complaining. But if you process things off-chain, then it helps the main chain scale because you're not, you're not performing all these, all these different computations on-chain. Uh, so that is a plus. Off-chain data can also provide scalability for smart contract applications. We'll talk more about that later privacy and immutability if required for the smart contract 
and then data storage to interact with the smart contracts when information is needed. And so you might wonder, well, what are, what are some things where this is actually useful in real life? How does this, you know, this is great and all, but can you, can you break it down in a way that makes a little bit more sense for say the average uh, potential user of, uh, of this? Well, do you need external data feeds or reliable automation bots or verifiable randomness? Cross-chain communication. Um, I mean, we're probably going to be living in a in a multi-chain world. Do you need Do you need to connect to your backend? Do you need to connect to Swift payments? Do you need to monetize your existing APIs? Look, there's got to be there's got to be business uh, a business model with all this in mind. Okay, business is what is what's going to drive the adoption. You can see what their what their goals are. Okay, I mean, it, it's obvious, right? It's simply obvious. And, and, and so this, again, is, is sort of just a step-by-step -step approach to understanding what is Chainlink, okay? So it is an Oracle network that stores and uses off-chain data for smart contracts to reference and execute on-chain data if they are called upon to do so, okay? So we have the Oracle network. What is an Oracle network? What is that? Well, an Oracle network is uh, when we talk about oral ne Oracle networks, blockchains are essentially isolated, decentralized networks that cannot connect to the outside world on their own. They need a mechanism that feeds real world data to them that is as trustworthy as the blockchain itself. Oracles function as a link connecting the real world with the blockchain world. Okay, so let's focus in on this. Oracles are trusted sources of information and they provide a solution that is highly scalable. They provide off-chain data computation, information, and features to blockchains to execute smart contracts. So centralized, our chain link is a decentralized Oracle network, okay? And you're gonna see this come up a lot, a decentralized Oracle network. It's a framework for building decentralized Oracle networks and is made up of many of these decent, Chainlink is a framework for building decentralized Oracle networks and is made up of many of these uh, with no cross dependencies is, is probably a better way to put it, okay? So let's look at this. We have a monolithic Oracle network limited to one Oracle network model. The nodes are forced to support all services. You have lower quality free data sources. Singular network introduces risks. You also have a heterogeneous Oracle network, okay? In this one, you have the diversity of Oracle network models, the nodes specialize in Oracle services, you can support any premium data sources, and you also have no cross dependencies across networks. So this is important to, to keep in mind. So you can see sort of the difference between one of the monolithic Oracle networks and a heterogeneous Oracle network, which is what Link is, is hoping to accomplish. So again, it's a decentralized Oracle network, or at least it's providing the framework. Okay, again, it was a better way to say it. It's, it's, I mean, this is probably what a lot of people would think of as just a decentralized Oracle network. But again, it's a framework for building decentralized Oracle networks and is made up of many of them with no cross dependencies. Decentralized Oracle networks are single interfaces to connect to any blockchain network. They aggregate external data resources and notify any changes to the blockchain, as you can see here, okay? Everything's gonna be working as well. I mean, a lot of, this, a lot of it's gonna be working um, uh, in, you know, with the smart contract. And again, we haven't gotten to smart contracts yet, and I, I have a feeling a lot of people already know what smart, smart contracts are, but um, just keep that in the back of your mind. In recent years, we have seen Oracle Networks function as the backend for decentralized finance or DeFi and smart contract networks. If you're not familiar with DeFi, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But remember, DeFi is, is one of the main sources of utility that we could argue that is driving the adoption of cryptocurrency. Chainlink decentralized Oracle Networks allow a better risk management for smart contracts since initiatives and incentives are provided to ensure data is real and correct while, while resolving disputes by using and comparing multiple data feeds. Decisions can be made on a set of rules agreed upon by all parties involved based on a consensus, all right? I mean, you guys are, are I'm sure, fully aware of this, but this again is, is for people who are probably new to cryptocurrency as well. So this is a new form of adjudication and contractual system layer based on verifiability rather than trust. Now, let's talk about DeFi 
and smart contracts. All right, and we've already mentioned on these um, a couple times, but I, I, I wanna talk about them more. We wanna dive into what is DeFi, what are smart contracts. You might think, well, I mean, I'm getting a little bit off base here. But look, this is important in understanding, right? It's, it's certainly important in understanding what's going on. So let's go through this. What are smart contracts? Smart contracts are censorship resistant contracts that guarantee an outcome without the need for a middleman. They, they are applications which run on a blockchain. They function as a basic if then, F, if X then Y type of rules. I set rules, I've said it many times. Cryptocurrency investing is a lot of if then statements. If X then Y, okay? Um, but you could also argue the smart contracts are the same thing, right? It's just a lot of if this, then that. If something happens, then carry out this other thing. It's, it's a fairly straightforward process. They cannot be changed once they're implemented on the blockchain. All right, this is important. And it also sort of goes back to when we talked about Ethereum and what does it mean to be Turing complete. Again, go watch that video if you haven't watched it yet. Smart contracts extend the functionality of blockchains from transaction execution only to a transaction system. They are a verifiable code that compose an agreement between all parties involved. And this is the beauty of smart contracts. Don't trust, verify. This is the whole idea behind cryptocurrency. Decentralized, and a lot of cryptocurrencies have, have, have become very centralized. Okay, but the, the core behind crypto is decentralization, right? We already have centralization elsewhere. <laughs> but I mean, we're, we're talking about decentralization. And you have verifiable code that can be verified by both parties. There's no, you know, there, there's no fine print. There's nothing like that. You both parties verify the code. It's there. They agree to it. We're good to go. Nothing can be implemented later to change that because again, it is in the smart contract. When an outcome is given to a smart contract, the codified set of agreements and or conflict resolution is released while holding everyone accountable for the end results. Obviously, having this type of security is, is going to be extremely useful. One thing we don't have today in, in a lot of the centralized world, right, is, is you don't fully know if, you're, if, you're, if everything's going to be settled at the end or if someone might um, not stick to their end of the bargain. The great thing about smart contracts is they don't have a choice. They, they simply do not have a choice. Financial applications do not carry counterparty risks anymore. For obvious reasons, data is key to executing smart contracts. When we talk about counterparty risk, by the way, what we're talking about is there's always a risk of, of what happens if this other person doesn't do what they're going to say they're going to do. Again, smart contracts make it so that they, they, they have to do it. Okay, it's set up in place so that people have to follow the rules. If the data is incorrect, then smart contracts do not execute correctly, no matter the amount of cryptographic or economic hardness. A smart contract application is any decentralized service that acts as a mechanism to execute an agreement on a blockchain. It's important because blockchains and smart contracts are transparent while solving the back-end problems of the traditional financial sector. Now this is a sort of a, a visualization between hybrid smart contracts uh, and how they will become more advanced over time. All right, so you have your decentralized Oracle network um, with the cross compute uh, or cross chain compute, off chain data, that goes to external services such as data providers, existing backends, payment systems. Um, and then you also have off-chain compute via keepers. And then down here, you have all the different smart contracts, right? Smart contract one, two, and three, and potentially more than one blockchain. Again, we're probably gonna be living in a multi-chain world and Chainlink is setting itself up to be perfectly integrated into this multi-chain world. So, in recent years, we have seen Oracle networks function as the backend for DeFi and smart contract networks. Okay, so we, we've talked about this before, but they allow better risk management. The decentralized Oracle networks allow better risk management for smart contracts since initiatives and incentives are provided to ensure the data is real and correct while resolving disputes by using and comparing multiple data feeds. This is where really, I mean, this is, this is where I think Chainlink is going to really make its push is it's so far, it's, it's very far ahead in terms of, in terms of these uh, decentralized Oracle networks than any other one out there, in my opinion, in my opinion. It's, it's extremely far ahead and it's integrating itself seamlessly now so that later it's just, I mean, it, it's going to help. I, I think it's going to help with the revolution of cryptocurrency. I, I think it's going to help considerably 
And you know, you might look at it today and say, well, then why is it not higher? Why is it not higher on Quinn, you know, up on the on the top 10 and whatnot? Well, once upon a time it was, and actually uh, back in August um, of 2020, Chainlink was in the top five. Since then, we've seen layer ones explode on popularity. We've watched money balls go from one to another. Eventually, eventually, I, I, I do think Link will have its day again. I do. Um, it's just a matter of time, right? I mean, you know, at the time of this video, just for, for, for future reference, if you're watching this video, the price of Link is around $33, I believe. Uh, last, last week, I think it was a couple weeks ago, it was down to like $27. Um, but I think right now it's maybe just over $30. Hopefully I can watch this video in the future and see it at several hundred dollars or maybe even more than that, um, market cycles down the road. Um, but anyways, let's, let's continue on here. Okay. So we've also talked about the, the idea of, of, of these smart contracts. And I, I wanted to just mention this, this was got, uh, you know, gotten from the Ethereum video, uh, a collection of smart contracts can execute an end goal by a collection of peer to peer permissionless networks. Some of the benefits, privacy, security, censorship, resistance, and trustlessness. The downsides, as I've said before, maintenance difficulty, scalability, and user experience. And the whole idea is that, yes, we understand these things exist today. We are working on fixing them, right? Well, not me working on fixing them, but the developers, right? The developers of, of, of a fear, right? They're, they're working on, on fixing these things in a way that does not compromise decentralization. Again, it's, it goes back to the blockchain trilemma, okay? Um, and, 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 and trying to solve one thing without compromising another. It's very difficult, and there's going to be a lot of blockchains that'll claim they've already done it. But again, Ethereum is ahead of these other ones, in my opinion. So DeFi is a type of smart contract and is short for decentralized finance, I'm sure many of you guys know, it is a form of hybrid smart contract that combines off-chain code versus off or on-chain code versus off-chain proofs. There are financial contractual agreements, lending, borrowing, yield, exposure, and or protection versus risk. And I'm sure a lot of people have done yield farming. Well, some of you guys have probably done yield farming and whatnot. Maybe you've lend out your, your cryptocurrency. Obviously, there's plenty of different applications that will allow you to do that. Uh, lending and borrowing. Um, we talked about yield farming and whatnot. Plenty of decentralized applications to do that as well. Arguably, DeFi is currently a risky environment, gaining the most adoption right now. It is incredibly risky. We will make no mistake about it because people are still figuring out uh, the smart contracts, coding them correctly, and, and then trying to figure out which ones are good, which ones are not. A lot of them just copy each other, to be completely honest. Like a lot of these smart contract platforms where people are going around the money balls going from one platform to another and you know, um, farming the native token and then dumping it because they don't, you know, they, they kind of are aware that it's just sort of a money ball going around. Um, you know, th this is this is certainly something that it is a risky environment, okay? We're seeing new farms pop up every single day, but at the end of the day, you know, some will stand the test of time, most won't, most won't. As these systems mature and grow, we will see them stabilize over time, okay? And we'll continue to see this every cycle and more utility comes every market cycle as well, which I think is one reason why we see cycles lengthen. Again, you cannot argue that market cycles of crypto do not lengthen. The first one lasted a very short period of time back in 2011. Um, and then the next one lasted, what, two and a half years uh, that took us into the end of 2013. The one after that lasted four years, which took us to the end of 2017. Mainly the speculation back in 2017 was just ICOs that a middle schooler could code and put spin up a nice WordPress site and pretend like it's the best thing since sliced bread. There just wasn't a whole lot, whole lot to speculate on, which I think is why cycles can extend in length. And as measured from the halving, the Bitcoin halving, this cycle has already extended in length. And I think it's probably going to continue to extend in length. Okay. And, and, uh, and there's just a lot more to speculate on each market cycle, right? What do you have this cycle? I mean, you also have smart contracts. Um, where people are, are again, they're, they're yield farming. You have, um, I mean, all, that's a subset, of course, of decentralized finance. There's a lot more to it than that. You also have NFTs as well. You have institutions coming into the space. It's different, right? I mean, it, it's, not that, it's not that this time is different. It's just that this time is more of the same and that every time is different, if that makes sense. So let me say that again. This time is not fundamentally different from the idea that it's like going a completely different route than it ever has before. No, it's the same in that every cycle is different because 
of there's of being more to speculate on. Okay, so it's more of the same of every cycle being slightly different. Okay, it's not all oh, this cycle is different because it's doing something. No, all of them are like that, but it's it's just a, a, a slow growth each cycle. And we'll as we continue to mature and grow, we'll see them stabilize over time. So you know, next market cycle, things will be more stabilized. There'll still be volatility, of course, but they'll be more stable than they were this cycle, which was more stable than they were last cycle, and so on and so forth. And hopefully we'll see things become less risky with time as more people understand like what is, you know, what is what works and what doesn't. The contractual centralized financial structure today are banks uh, or third parties who hold your assets or products and promises to honor their agreements. These are how there are, however, several problems that arise. We've talked about that as well. Um, because you don't really, right, don't trust Verify. Don't trust some third party to do it for you, verify it for yourself. So why trust these entities when you don't have to? How do you know they'll keep their end of the bargain? How do you know they aren't using these contracts behind our backs to benefit themselves? How do you know you won't be censored or locked out if, if we do something disagreeable to the company bank managing our holdings? How do you know? You don't know, right, you don't know. You could wake up one day and everything's completely locked and you can't use it anymore. And you have to jump through a thousand hoops to be able to use it again. How do we know the agreement is just and valid? There's a lot of things we have to, we have to navigate when you talk about centralization and, and third parties that control things. How do we know and verify that there aren't other contracts that are underlying the contract we are signing and what their relationships are? How do we verify the historical trustworthiness of this system? Banks and companies have proved themselves to not always hold the, the, the company or the, sorry, the public's interest at heart, okay? There's definitely some examples in recent history. We know there's the 2008 mortgage crisis, the financial crisis back then where companies, a lot of different companies back then profited in the billions of dollars um, while they distributed mortgages they knew would go insolvent, uh, only to buy them up later for, for pennies on the dollar. Uh, there was also the short squeeze not too long ago if you guys remember for GameStop, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was what earlier this year where we had the short squeeze and 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 you you also had you know you had these platforms basically making it so you could not you could not even buy GameStop stock or you couldn't even buy it. And then also, don't even forget about uh, back when the metal market was rigged um, a while ago, and uh, there was a fine of nine hundred and twenty million dollars. Okay, so. A proposed solution with DeFi, an agreement structure based on a type of hybrid smart contract that uses a different form of mechanism to execute transactions. Blockchains are smart contract systems that provide the following. They force transparency and clarity of the contract by being open and transparent. They allow individuals to control their own assets and become responsible for them. They have, you have global open source systems that anyone can use without the risk of censorship. And they provide better yield less than 1% in banks versus 8% in DeFi. Now note that these percentages will probably change with time, but right now with banks, you get basically nothing. With DeFi, I mean, you can, you can pretty easily find higher interest rates. The protocol and code can be verified and inspected and permissionless and thus anyone can execute them. As smart contracts can run autonomously, they guarantee an outcome and anyone can access without custodial authority and you can interact without middlemen. Finally, you can track collateral in real time and calculate exposure and leverage. Okay, so the modern corporate system, of course, looks something like this. Okay, and and you know you basically have people that are are deciding on on all these different decisions without potentially without your best interest in mind. Decentralized finance, everyone decides. Everyone gets a vote. Everyone gets a vote. Okay, so. Maybe we'll do a second video on this. There's obviously a lot more to talk about with Chainlink, um, but I wanted to provide at least an introductory video to, to why Chainlink is important, what it's providing. Um, again, it, it's providing uh, a system to, you know, for decentralized Oracle networks, and we've systematically gone through the importance of all of this. So let me know if you guys want a second video on this, and, and maybe we'll do one. We'll, we'll dive into Chainlink even more than we already have. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, check out the Telegram channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Thank you guys for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Bye.